Well, as I mentioned this evening, we're going back to Psalm 119. We hadn't quite made it all the way through yet, although there aren't that many sections left. We are going to be looking at uh, verses 113 through 120. Psalm 119, beginning in verse 113. And again, we're looking at uh, two themes from this particular section. Uh, the, the first is why, basically, why we should obey. And the reason is because there's safety in obedience and blessing in obedience. And then the other thing, the other theme we're looking at is why it is we should avoid the double-minded because, as we're going to see, they will hinder us from being able to keep God's law and receiving the blessing that He promises. So let's read the text as we begin. Psalm 119, beginning in one, verse 113. The psalmist writes, I hate those who are double-minded, but I love your law. You are my hiding place and my shield. I wait for your word. Depart from me, evildoers, that I may observe the commandments of my God. Sustain me according to your word that I may live and do not let me be ashamed of my hope. Uphold me that I may be safe, that I may have regard for your statutes continually. You have rejected all those who wander from your statutes for their deceitfulness is useless. You have removed all the wicked of the earth like dross. Therefore, I love your testimonies. My flesh trembles for fear of you. And I am afraid of your judgments. May the Lord bless His word to our hearing this evening. And again, sometimes these verses almost look like they're just random thoughts strung together, but they're not. There is a logical order to these, and, and I want to make it as applicable as possible. So I'm trying to put what I'm saying in terms of application as we sort of delve into this. Now, I already mentioned this morning, we were looking at the need to reach out to others with the gospel. We saw that one of the main things that gets in our way is fear. One way to overcome fear is with love. I mean, love basically, if you desire something strongly enough, you know you'll find a way through every obstacle to get to the object of that love. Love pushes through every barrier. And it will do the same thing for the lost. If you really love the lost and you really want to see someone come to faith in Christ, you will find a way to get the gospel to them. Again, realizing it's the only way. So love is one way to overcome fear. Another way to overcome fear is with promise. The Lord's promise of protection. Because, you know, we're afraid of what might happen to us if we share the gospel and so forth, but we don't need to be because God tells us that He will be with us. Jesus, when He gave the Great Commission, said, I will be with you even to the end of the age. You don't need to be afraid. I mean, what can man do to you? He, the, the worst he can do is send you into the arms of God, and that's actually a great blessing. That's not a curse. So if out of love for your lost neighbor, you're going to reach out to them with the gospel and expose yourself to their hatred. It's good to know that God is going to be with you, that He's going to help you. That's what the psalmist says that He will do if you meet the qualification, and that qualification is obedience. Now, if the Lord promises to protect you if you obey Him, and if you are to experience basically his blessings, and by the way, these blessings are not just protection, but it really has to do with all of His blessings. You do need to avoid those things that are going to weaken your obedience, or in other words, or another way of putting it would be you need to avoid the things that weaken your love and your commitment to God's law. Now, I do believe that the psalmist here addresses at least one thing that can severely weaken your love for God's law. And it's perhaps one of those things that will do it more than just about anything else. And that is when you develop relationships with people who don't love God's law, who don't take it seriously. Uh, that's why the psalmist writes in Psalm, uh, well, in verse 113, I hate those who are double 
minded, but I love your law. I mean, not only are they dishonoring to God, but they also draw you away from your commitment to Him. <clears throat> now, I think it's important for us to understand what it means to be double-minded. Another way of putting it is to be half-hearted, to have a divided heart, not really you know, being certain whether or not you want to commit yourself to do something or not. It means to hesitate, uh, to be undecided. Uh, another word that we use commonly today is fickle. You know, fickle means you, you start moving one direction, you change your mind, you go another direction and so forth. Uh, when you're fickle regarding God's law, that is not a good thing. Now, what is it you experience when you're around somebody who is like this? Somebody, uh, well, rather than, well, I'll tell you what, rather than thinking about what they're like, let's think about what it's like when you're around somebody who is passionate about something. Uh, their passion can have an effect on you. Their passion can encourage you. It can incite the same kind of thing in you. And of course, if their passion is for something good, then it can have a good effect on you because it will also instill within you a passion for that good thing. If it's a passion for something that's bad, then that can be bad for you. It can be a temptation. Now, what happens when you're around somebody, though, who is divided, somebody who is undecided, somebody who is indifferent about something? How does that affect you? Well, I think it has a similar effect. It tempts you also to be half-hearted about it as well. I'll never forget, because I got burned by this, but I'll never forget when I was working at a gas station years ago, it was after hours, somebody was coming in for something, and a friend of mine started telling me about this person who was coming in and filling my mind with ideas, many reasons why I shouldn't listen to this guy, I shouldn't help him, I shouldn't let him in. Well, I listened to my friend, and I didn't let the guy in. Turned out that he was a very close friend of the owner and uh, got me into a lot of trouble. Now, if my friend hadn't been there, I think I would have just simply helped the guy because that's, that's what I would normally do. But I was influenced by my friend. You see, friends can influence us. They can uh, influence us in a good way or in a bad way. And if you should surround yourself, as, as I believe the psalmist is pointing us to here, with people who are double-minded, who are half-hearted about seeking God and obeying Him, you're going to find your own commitment to these things growing weaker and yourself obeying less. So it shouldn't surprise us when we read about how much the psalmist really loved God and how much he really wanted to obey Him, it shouldn't surprise us how he felt about those who were half-hearted. I mean, look at what he says, I hate those who are double-minded. You know, there's a sense in which God hates them too because the double-minded, I mean, that's, that's basically wickedness. James writes this in James 4.8, draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. See, double-minded are in the category of sinners that need to repent. Jesus said to the church at Laodicea, a very familiar passage in Revelation 3, 15 through 16, I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you were lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. And you'll recall as a Greg Hodson told us on one occasion, a way of putting this into the vernacular is, you make me sick and I'm going to throw you up if you don't commit yourself to me. Well, you see, being double-minded, being half-hearted, being hesitant, that's the same thing as being lukewarm and lukewarmness makes the Lord sick. Now, if you really love the Lord and you want to serve Him, then it should have the same effect upon you as well, being around those kind of people who aren't really committed to the Lord. You need to avoid people like this. Now, not absolutely. You need to avoid them as friends, having close acquaintance with them because they will drag you down spiritually. They will tempt you to become half-hearted or lukewarm to be sickening to the Lord. 
What you should do instead is uh, spend time with the godly, with those who are committed, who are passionate about the Lord and His law, because if you do, that will strengthen your commitment to the Lord. Now, as I said, we don't want to avoid these people absolutely. The double-minded, I mean, that, ex- that describes everybody who is, who is unconverted, everybody who is outside the church. But instead of having them as your friends, you need to see them as objects of evangelism. You need to try to bring them to Christ. They are your neighbors, and you need to love them by bringing the gospel to them, as we saw this morning. Now, again, why is it important that your love for God's law become stronger? Well, again, because when your love for His law is strong, you're safe, because love for the law brings obedience, and obedience brings God's blessing. The psalmist writes in verse 114, you are my hiding place and my shield. I wait for your word. Now, we we saw in Psalm 18 the fact that, that God is a fortress, a refuge, a shield for all who love Him and who serve Him. He is a hiding place, which means He is one to whom you can run and hide yourself from trouble, from danger. He is one who will be your shield to protect you if you take hold of Him. And if the Lord is your protector, you don't need to be afraid of anything because you're in God's hands. Nothing can ultimately harm you. But this will only be true for you if you obey Him, if you, in other words, as he puts it here, wait for His Word. Uh, To wait for God's Word means to put your hope in it, you know, to, to read it, to listen to it, to submit to it, to trust the Lord that He is going to fulfill it. The Lord blesses those who trust Him, those who wait upon Him. Uh, they will, uh, well, they will find God to be a shield to them in times of difficulty, shielding you from evil, shielding you from things too strong for you, helping you when you need help. And again, of course, uh, being a place of refuge from all difficulty and trouble. Now, to put this another way, if you have to wait for the Lord before basically He will be a shield and a protector to you, this is just simply saying that you need to listen to Him before He's going to listen to you. As I was thinking about that, I was reminded about what Solomon says in the book of Proverbs. You know how um, he talks about uh, wisdom, lifts up her voice in the streets and so forth, and she calls out to the naive. He talks about wisdom, lady wisdom, quite a bit, and he talks about the adulterous woman quite a bit. And both of these are basically the personification of two principles, obedience and sin, that you need to listen to God's law, you need to listen to wisdom, you need to embrace her, as it were, and you need to avoid the adulterous woman. Well, Solomon tells us what happens if we won't listen to Lady Wisdom, which is if we don't listen to the law of God and if we don't obey it, versus what happens if we do listen to it or to her. In Proverbs 1, verses 24 through 33, Now, he starts off with the downside. This is Lady Wisdom speaking, and again, it's the law of God. Because I called and you refused, I stretched out my hand and no one paid attention, and you neglected all my counsel and did not want my reproof. I will also laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your dread comes, when your dread comes like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you. Then they will call on me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but they will not find me because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would not accept my counsel. They spurned all my reproof. So they shall eat of the fruit of their own way and be satiated with their own devices. For the waywardness of the naive will kill them and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But he who listens to me shall live securely and will be at ease from the dread of evil. Now, does it matter how we respond to God's word? Does it matter how we respond to his commandments? Does it matter whether we listen to God? You see, if you don't listen to God, if you don't obey God, then there are consequences for that. 
But if you will listen and you will obey, notice again, you will live securely. And you will be at ease from the dread of evil. God will protect you. So again, the psalmist cycles back again. Well, if it's true that obedience is going to lead to this blessing, then how can you listen more closely? How can you obey more carefully? Well, again, he emphasizes the fact you need to separate yourself from half-hearted, lukewarm, hesitant company so they don't drag you down. The psalmist writes in verse 115, "'Depart from me, evildoers, that I may observe the commandments of my God.'" Why does he want them to leave and get out of his, out of his way or out of his presence? It's so that he might obey. If you have close company, keep close company with a half-hearted, it's going to drag you down. You need to separate yourself from bad influences, close relationships with unbelievers. Again, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15.33, very familiar passage, I've mentioned it many, many times, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. After talking about light and darkness, that we're light, the world's in darkness and ought to be in close partnership with them, Paul again writes in 2 Corinthians 6, 17, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord. Now, that's why the Lord commanded His people when they were going into the land of Canaan to drive out the evil inhabitants of the land, really to destroy them so that they would not be tempted to imitate them and be destroyed along with them. Now, listen to what the Lord says through, um, well, actually Moses says in Deuteronomy 18, verses 9 through 13. When you enter the land which the Lord your God gives you, you shall not learn to imitate the detestable things of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, one who uses divination, one who practices witchcraft, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who casts a spell, or a medium, or a spiritus, or one who calls up the dead. For whoever does these things is detestable to the Lord, and because of these detestable things, the Lord your God will drive them out before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God." Now, we don't live in the land of Canaan. Perhaps these particular things aren't the things that, that are around us, although I, I think a good number of these are being practiced around us. But there are evil things that can also soil us, that can also pollute us. The Lord still calls us to be blameless. And the only way we can is by walking according to His Word. So the closer you are to the double-minded, to the half-hearted, to the hesitant, to the evil, to the wicked, the worse it's going to be for you. But the more you separate yourself from them, then the more you're going to be strengthened to do what the Lord calls you to do, to be blameless that you might receive His blessings. Now again, the the next thing I, I believe he's pointing out is that if you are able to do this, if you do separate yourself from their influence, and you do seek to obey Him, that it will strengthen you and give you the grace that you need, the strength you need to take hold of His promise. Verse 116, sustain me according to your word that I may live, and do not let me be ashamed of my hope. Thomas Shepard once wrote, again, something that I don't think all believers necessarily understand. But if you want God's promises, and I hope you all do because they are precious and without them you will perish. If you want God's promises, you have to be willing to embrace everything in God's Word, right? Some people, you know, have the Bible promise book and they open up the book and there's all these promises sort of taken and out of their context and you read one a day just to encourage yourself that God's going to give me all these things. This is what God has to give you. But really, what it needs to be woven together with is the rest of the scriptures that go around with it, which include threatenings, which include commandments, which basically call us to holiness and obedience and love. 
We have to, as Thomas Shepard reminds us, we have to be willing to take a hold of everything God gives us if we're going to take hold of these promises. If you want His blessings, you do need to tremble when He threatens. If you want the, the blessings, you do need to obey when He commands. You see, it's only if you do that you're qualified to ask the Lord for the rest of His blessings or for the things that He's promised. And when you do these things, you know that the Lord is going to give them to you because He has bound Himself to do that. But He has only bound Himself to do that if you listen to Him. In other words, if you obey Him. You might say that obedience validates faith's checkbook. Remember faith's checkbook, uh, Spurgeon's uh, collection of promises, the checks that you can take to the bank of heaven present the draft, as it were, and, and know that you're going to get what God has promised. But if you take these things to the bank of heaven without obedience, is the Lord going to cash them? Well, actually, the Bible tells us that He won't. If you don't listen to Him, He's not going to listen to you. You have to obey the Lord. And again, it's not a work that you're doing so much as simply working with the grace of God. You can't obey God apart from His grace, really, at all. But having the grace of God, it's still possible to disobey. And as long as you're disobeying, you really can't expect that God's going to give you anything other than what you really need. If you're His, that's a spanking. The Lord will discipline you. And He will do that because He loves you. But don't expect God to lavish blessings on you if you're not going to obey Him. He's going to give you what you need, and what you need is the blessing of discipline. Now, if you will do this, if you will obey Him, and then you look to Him for the promises, God is not going to disappoint you. He will not allow you to be put to shame. I was thinking about our Reformation series and how we saw four men who were willing to stand up and obey God, and God used them very powerfully. These four men, would you say they were loved by the world or hated by the world? Yeah, they were hated by the world because of their commitment to Christ. Now, two of them were actually, you know, they were hated, but they lived to the end of their lives, and their lives, I'd say, were shortened because of all the stress they were under. And two of them were burned at the stake, but how many of them were actually put to shame? None of them were put to shame. Now, the world might have been ashamed of them, and the world might have wanted them out of their sight, but God wasn't ashamed of them. And when the Lord had done through them all that He had intended to do through them in their lives here, He took them out of this world. He took them to heaven that He might honor them for the rest of time. The Bible says all who put their hope in the Lord will never be put to shame, and that includes you. If you obey the Lord and you look to Him, He will bless you. Now, one final thing that I believe the psalmist gives us here that can strengthen your commitment to separate from the half-hearted and the hesitant and the fickle so that you might obey God is to consider what God is going to do to them. Uh, what, actually, not what He will do to them, but what He does do to them. After the psalmist prays one more time for strength in verse 117, uh, that he might obey and be safe, he says, Uphold me that I may be safe, that I may have regard for your statutes continually. He then explains what this is going to keep him safe from. Okay? Uphold me that I might be safe. Safe from what? Well, safe not only from the attacks of the wicked, as we've seen before, God is a refuge to those who will obey Him, but safe from God. I mean, God is the one who is also to be feared. What is it that God does to the half-hearted, to the double-minded, to the fickle? Look at verse 118. You have rejected all those who wander from your statutes, for their deceitfulness is useless. God will reject them. He will reject those who do not obey Him. He will reject those who hesitate, those who are lukewarm. Remember what Jesus says, you make me sick with your lukewarmness, I will vomit you out of my mouth. That's not a blessing. Okay, that, that isn't a blessing. 
Jesus says in Matthew 7, verses 22 and through 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons and in your name perform any miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. The psalmist says, you have rejected all those who wander from your statutes. Jesus says, I never knew you. You you practice lawlessness your whole life. You haven't obeyed me, regardless of what you might have thought. Notice, it doesn't matter what they think. He says, their deceitfulness is useless, and I think what he means by that is the fact that they're deceiving themselves or others into thinking that they are obedient. They're not. When you, when you stand before the Lord on that day, you're not going to be able to fool Him. He knows whether you obeyed Him or not. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You have to actually to obey the Lord if you are to see heaven. Now, the psalmist goes on to say that not only will the Lord reject them, but the Lord is constantly removing the wicked from the earth like dross when gold is refined. He's refining the earth. Verse 119, you've removed all the wicked of the earth like dross. You know, the Bible says, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 1, that the wrath of God is being revealed every day from heaven against the wicked. (coughs) against the ungodly, against those who suppress the knowledge of God in their wickedness. God is removing the wicked from the earth like dross. Every evil person who has ever died has done so by God's will. They die (coughs) in order that God may cleanse the earth from them. (coughs) Excuse me. (coughs) Now, we realize that the righteous also die, but that's not the same thing. God actually removes the righteous from the earth in order that He may take them to heaven to keep them safe, to bless them, to protect them. But why does He allow the wicked to die? It is that He might cleanse the earth from them. Now, considering that... That can help you do a couple of things. It can help you love God's law more. I mean, the thought of this made the psalmist love it more because it showed him how he might avoid that judgment and how he might walk in safety. Notice he says again in verse 119, you have removed all the wicked of the earth like dross. (coughs) Therefore, I love your testimonies. The thought of the fact that God is cleansing the earth of them makes him love the law more because the law shows him the way of safety and how he might avoid that. And that is because of the fear of the Lord, because this also can make you fear God more as the psalmist did. Look at what he says in verse 120, my flesh trembles for fear of you and I am afraid of your judgments. As he sees what the Lord is doing to the wicked, it makes him afraid that he doesn't get numbered among the wicked by departing from God, by not listening to Him, by not obeying Him, by spending so much time with the wicked that he actually goes the same direction that they do. Now, we realize that can't happen to a true believer. God's not going to allow you to fall away, but if you don't truly love and fear the Lord, being with those people can draw you away and you can face the same judgment. And we do need to recognize also in Scripture that God does actually warn even His own people as a means to get them to stay close to Him so that they don't fall away from Him. A a healthy fear of God's justice can go a long ways in helping you obey so that His judgments don't fall on you. The psalmist was, was a converted man. My flesh trembles for fear of you, and I am afraid of your judgments, not just because he was an Old Testament believer, but because he understood who God is. 
Remember Solomon writes this in Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. When you fear the Lord, it encourages you to do the right thing. So love draws us out. You know, I, I see what you're doing to the wicked. You remove them all like dross. Therefore, I love your testimonies. It can encourage love, but it can also engender fear. Fear can kind of push you in the right direction. Love kind of draws you out in the right direction. And those two work together. And they can work together in your life to help you obey. So do you want God's protection? Do you want His blessings? Then you need to obey. That's what the Lord says. Do you want to obey Him more that you might receive more of these blessings? Well, then you need to separate yourself from the kind of company that's going to weaken your love and commitment to God and to His law and seek the kind of company that will strengthen them. Uh, as, as far as it's applicable, you need to have the heart of David. And let me just read these verses as we close. Psalm 101, verses 2 through 8. This is, this is what David wrote. I will give heed to the blameless way. I will set no worthless thing before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not fasten its grip on me. A perverse heart shall depart from me. I will know no evil. Whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him I will destroy. No one who has a haughty look and an arrogant heart will I endure. My eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land that they may dwell with me. He who walks in a blameless way is the one who will minister to me. He who practices deceit shall not dwell within my house. He who speaks falsehood shall not maintain his position before me. Every morning I will destroy all the wicked of the land so as to cut off from the city of the Lord all those who do iniquity." Now, again, we're not King David. It's not in our hands to execute judgment and justice in the land, but I want you to notice David had a desire for those who love the Lord to be close to him and those who hated him to be far away because he knew he, what he needed himself to be faithful. He knew what he loved and what he wanted. Remembering what God does to those who are lukewarm, let's not forget as well not only to avoid close company with them, but let's not forget also to reach out to them with the gospel. I mean, even those lukewarm within the church, we need to reach out to them with the gospel in order that they might be saved. We need to pray for them in order that they may escape God's judgment. But in order that we may have God's protection and be safe as we seek to do that, we need to make sure that we keep ourselves separate from those who are compromising and that we obey the Lord with all our hearts. Well, let's, let's uh, bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us take all that we've seen this evening and apply it, to put it into practice so that we might be able to become stronger in this, in this area.